Well, hello everyone. This is Data Driven Formula One with Patrick Hanson Gana Pagrebna. Hi, Patrick. Hello, Gana. Hello, all. And superstitions, the topic which we discussed various times that we have to do this, and now we are doing it. Yes, that's right. So now we got the superstitions. And um, this is a very cool topic because uh, not only um, uh, team principals, drivers have superstitions, but also family members <laughs> of the drivers. Um, for example, the, yeah, the story probably that I want to tell before we start is um, uh, something that I saw in, in, in a documentary quite a few years ago is uh, basically a story about Lewis Hamilton and his dad. So, as you know, Lewis Hamilton has a very bright helmet. Uh, and um, the story behind it, apparently, is that um, the reason why he has this bright helmet is, you know, as, as you know, his dad was really supporting uh, um, his uh, hobby first, right, as a uh, in kind of as a junior driver. Uh, and then uh, for quite a few years, uh, Lewis Hamilton's dad was his manager. And, uh, you know, because it's so um, risky, right, to be on the track, uh, he always wanted to see where his son was. And uh, this is why this was the, uh, the helmet that was produced in this bright color, such that you could spot it from, um, from afar. Uh, and, so, you know, it's, it was important for him to kind of, you know, always see these bright colors. Um, and that reminds me to a famous quote by Kimi Raikkonen, who have been asked uh, what the helm uh, means to him, and he answered, it protects my head. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and, you know, the, so, so basically, uh, we, to, today we will talk about all sorts of things, uh, including colors and, <laughs> and, and other things, <laughs> that, uh, and, and something that the, the drivers uh, uh, like to wear. Um, so we'll mention several cases and, uh, yeah, let's look at them. Um, yes, and, uh, in general, in general, interesting is that, uh, this is a topic which, uh, stayed relevant over the whole time in formula one. So from the beginning and up to today, uh, drivers are superstitious and we discuss uh, also a little bit why this is the reason. Okay, and we start with Fernando Alonso. <laughs> exactly. So for the uh, for the ones who are just with the Audi podcast, uh, let me read uh, what you can see in our slide. Alonso was one of the few drivers being skeptical about the benefit of track walks, but changed his opinion in 2021. And uh, now uh, we quote, I did one in uh, Portimao this year because it was a new circuit and it was the best weekend. We scored good points and we felt competitive there. We stopped doing it in Barcelona and in Monaco, and we came back to not scoring points. So we said, okay, we try again uh, in Baku, we finished sixth, so it was our best race. From that moment, we keep doing track walks, and it keeps us scoring points on Sunday. So at the moment, it is a pure superstitious thing. Yeah, yeah, and, um, you know, it's uh, it's obviously... Um, we will we will come back to this, uh, but uh, you know when when you are dealing with uncertain environments, right? You often develop superstitions, and exactly. uh, it comes from the necessity to uh, control, right? So yeah. in behavioral science, we have uh, this bias uh, that we call illusion of control. It's when people believe they control something or some random events <laughs> that actually do not can, cannot be controlled. Well, Formula One is not very random, right? So we cannot say that it's random because um, a lot depends on the teamwork, on the skill of the driver and how these factors work together. But yeah. it does involve a significant proportion of uncertainty, right? So there are yeah. Uh, random events that can affect your result even so even if you are in the best car and even if you are the best driver um you know sometimes um you know you you, you basically would have an event that is unexpected like uh, 
uh, collision or collision of other drivers uh, that could affect your performance. Another story that I want to tell, uh, uh, kind of again, the some stylist fact, I'm not going to mention the team and who told me this, but, um, you know, I have uh, quite a few connections in different teams mm. and uh, um, uh, one team, uh, people in one of the Formula One teams uh, told me uh, stories about um, Kimi Raikkonen and uh, that, you know, he, uh, when he was uh, with that particular team, uh, there was uh, something wrong every time he was in the car. And it was always something different. So they couldn't quite understand what was happening. So they considered him to be this like really unlucky driver. <laughs> so uh, so there were quite, uh, quite a few superstitions that they have developed uh, as a result of uh, this collaboration. But um, the point is that, yeah, you have normally... Uh, an environment with uh, either uh, which is really uncertain or that has some degree of uncertainty like formula one and uh, in this environment it's highly likely that people want to reduce this uncertainty right so that's a rational feeling we want to always reduce uncertainty and um, yeah we try to create ourselves this illusion of control. So like this tra track walk that, that Fernando Alonso is describing. So, you know, if you think that, you know, it will give you more control during the race uh, and decrease uncertainty, you will do it. Exactly. And, uh, is this, uh, we are already exactly going to the topic, uh, what you explained, why we have superstition in uh, Formula One. Uh, I mean, the first answer would be, why not? Because we have superstition everywhere else. But uh, besides this, of course, we want to dig a little bit uh, deep, uh, deeper. So in general, you may say Formula One drivers uh, perform on the limits, sometimes overstepping their limits. And this triggers a fear of loss of control, what you already explained. Uh, and so we have statistically confirmed, but no proven rituals help to perceive drivers to perceive themselves to be in control and here we have the uh, statistical versus uh, causal uh, relation yeah that's right and uh, you know this is not only true for formula one it's true for some for other situations like currently we have um, we have been affected by covid quite a lot and you see this uh, um necessity to control uh, to, to control situation so uh, you know resulting in some bizarre things for example if you remember at the beginning of pandemic in 2020 we had some shortages with certain goods right like toilet paper or sanitizers and all these types of things and again this comes from the desire to control the situation of course you can never buy enough uh, toilet paper or hand sanitizer to be in full control, but uh, having some of these things makes you calmer, right? Calms you down. And um, so this is, uh, you know, not only true for um, risky sports like Formula One, but also in your everyday life, you are also affected by the same behavioral bias. And yeah. now we will look at, uh, you know, drivers who, uh, whose, whose job it is to, to take risk, right? So it's their job to take risk. And yeah. at the same time, they are just people. Uh, they're simply exactly. people and they're also trying to deal with these situations. Yes, and, uh, uh, and due to this, uh, uh, analyzing this topic in Formula One, uh, we can have a lot of uh, good lessons. For example, if you are in, in um, working in human resources, um, uh, studying the psychology inside organizations, because here we see that uh, especially uh, people who are at the limit, which uh, take decisions, sorry, make decisions under uncertainty, we have uh, the situation that you can take uh, the logical best uh, decision, but nevertheless, as have a negative uh, outcome. This is, if you're not uh, um, that good with statistics, something people sometimes do not 
uh, understand. And this is uh, uh, in contra what you discussed, uh, the need to perceive control over this situation. It's a statistical versus causal relation. And this is something which we see um, not only today, not only let's say it formula one, but something which we see in uh, over all history. And uh, I like to take the, um, make the example of the Maya priests. They had, uh, the Mayas, they had been quite knowledgeable. They had uh, knowledge in astronomy. They had a calendar. Uh, but uh, something they did not really understand, uh, this was the uh, impact uh, of uh, on climate change, I mean, on long-term climate change, but also on um, just uh, weather changes. So if there had been, let's say, five, and I'll make this a little bit over uh, simplifying, if there had been, let's say, one month without rain, uh, they uh, sac sacrificed uh, some uh, people uh, on top of the pyramid, and with this, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, influence their gods that they will send rain, which sometimes, uh, which, a, which a lot of times happened, because if you do this ritual in the beginning of uh, April and the rain season starts in May, uh, let's say, or in the middle, if you're sorry, if you do this ritual in the beginning of uh, April and the rain season, let's say, starts in the middle of April normally, there's a high probability that you will see rain two weeks later and especially uh, uh, all your people around you which have uh, a lot of less knowledge uh, than yourself uh, they will think that uh, the rain became too uh, based on this um, sacrifice and not because uh, it was the beginning of the normal rain time so and uh, the mayan priests as they had this limited knowledge they could uh, play a little bit of course this can happily uh, backfire i mean if you sacrifice a person and then there's no rain coming then the people will turn against you because they think that uh, you do not have the contact with the gods anymore and uh, you may be the next person to be sacrificed so be dangerous a little bit dangerous yeah, that's right. I just also want to say um, uh, that um, uh, a lot of people believe uh, that if we have a really rational person, they are not prone to superstition. Uh, but that's obviously not true. And let me give an example of uh, the driver that we have lately discussed in quite a lot of episodes, Nikki Lauda, right? So Nikki Lauda was very calculating and kind of statistically based person. Uh, so he would always calculate um, the, the uh, risk, right? The, the, uh, the risk of accident, for example, uh, before the race. And uh, but even he had superstitions. So, for example, he believed that if the risk is higher than fifteen percent, then you shouldn't race. But of course, if you are using statistical approach, then it's very it should be very circumstantial, right? So under certain circumstances, you should go for it. And under other circumstances, you shouldn't go for it. So, uh, but he had this kind of threshold in his head that, you know, 15% mm -hmm. is okay, but 16% is already not okay, or 15.1% is already not okay. Uh, and that's, of course, something that no rational theory can explain. So uh, I just want to say that it often does not depend on whether you're rational or not rational. Uh, you know, you still can be, uh, you, you still can exhibit uh, those behaviors. And this is especially interesting with Formula One drivers because risk is their job, right? It's their job to deal yes. with high, highly risky and changing environments. Uh, and, you know, people co psychologically cope with these environments in different ways. So let's look at uh, uh, the drivers. Exactly, and we start, uh, start uh, in a chronological um, order. So we start even before uh, Formula One, but it has a, uh, an impact on F Formula One today. And we are speaking about Ugo Sivocci. He was an uh, Italian uh, driver uh, active in uh, 1913 to 1923, where he had unfortunately a fatal accident. Uh, he was, uh, as you described, uh, Kimi, he was uh, quite unlucky. He was very talented, but for some reason always had some kind of problem why he couldn't finish uh, the race or some always something happening, uh, same as uh, to Kimi, as you mentioned. 
so here uh, his mechanics uh, they got an idea and they would uh, paint a four leaf clover on his uh, car uh, i mean a general sign of uh, good luck and uh, since the first time he had this uh, clover on his car uh, he overcame uh, this bad luck uh, won the races due to his uh, talent uh, similar uh, to what you explained uh, with uh, Kimmy's father, also this they, this may have had a second reason, because putting uh, this uh, big uh, four-lever clover on the dark red car made it easier for the smaller competitors to understand, to see that uh, Ugo, one of the fastest, was behind you, and hopefully they would uh, give him space to overtake. So this, there had been also a rational part uh, besides showing um, a good luck uh, charm so this uh, this was uh, his became then his uh, good luck charm and uh, and this is let's say the tragic story which makes people again uh, uh, may believe in bad luck or, or superstitious because uh, later he uh, died tragically in a testing event. He was testing the new Alfa Romeo P1 in uh, preparation for the Italian Grand Prix. Uh, but this was testings. It was not directly for the official race. And due to this, uh, the four leaf clover was not painted yet on his car. And But nevertheless, uh, he drove it and he died in the car where for the first time since he implemented it, he not used the clover. So uh, people may understood this as, uh, again, as bad luck or uh, superstition. Yeah, that's right. And um, I just want to say that, uh, again, um, you know, this, this, this shows that uh, Formula One drivers are not uh, different from regular people. And, um, you know, sometimes you need a, cl a clover or, uh, you know, I I'm, I'm sure many students uh, would understand me when, you know, they often have some sort of object that they need to take to an exam, right, uh, for good luck. And this is uh, actually a very similar situation here. Um, and of course, uh, this uh, psychologically helps people, right? So it, if, you know, if you believe that uh, green clo clover is going to make a difference, uh, then you just feel more confident and you perform better. Yes. Um, uh, like in the in case of uh, Ugo Sivoki and uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, mm -hmm. yeah, of course, you're yeah, right. It is also uh, fosters uh, somehow your psychology, and if you have this positive attitude, uh, you uh, you have uh, better results. And um, oh, and this, uh, of course, has an impact uh, until today because this uh, four leaf clover became the official uh, symbol of the Alfa Romeo uh, racing team. So, so you see it still today on their uh, racing cars. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you would be amazed uh, what happens sometimes when people do not have uh, uh, this object with them, right? So obviously, yes. I observe a lot it's of dependent. students. Yeah, I observe a lot of students on a regular basis. And yeah, if they, some of them have these important objects for them. And, you know, if they don't uh, see this object then, uh, or they don't have this object with them, it's uh, yeah. It, it it sometimes causes uh, a panic attack, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, exactly. in universities, uh, you know, I observed it uh, quite often. Yeah. yeah and uh, so this is uh, quite similar uh, to the official Ferrari logo, which had a similar uh, background. It uh, it was originally the symbol of uh, an Italian uh, fighter uh, pilot. Uh, uh, who died and uh, the mother of this pilot gave it to Enzo Ferrari as a uh, good, good luck charm. So um, a little bit going into the same direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With this, we're coming to Tassio Novolari for many, one of the best drivers of all the times. Uh, on the other hand, he, he, of course, he never is inside the Formula One statistics for very easy reason uh, because his active years ended in 39 so pretty much uh, 
uh, 11 years before the start of uh, Formula One. And uh, you can see he's wearing his uh, good uh, Lux uh, charm, which was a uh, Tortoise, which is mm -hmm. um, Tortoise. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I just wanted to say, which is a more elegant name of a turtle, as everybody knows who saw Blade Runner. <laughs> uh, so he. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so he wore it uh, really uh, all the time. Uh, he also he printed it on his uh, stationery, on his uh, personal uh, paper. He uh, even painted it on his private uh, airplane. Uh, besides, he did um, some copies of it to give it to uh, special friends. So he really uh, was very fond of this uh, of this uh, turtle and had it uh, used it everywhere in and outside uh, the races. Yeah, but uh, I, I just want to, s to say why it is a turtle and uh, the, the tortoise and not, uh, and not something else. Of course, it goes back to Aesop Tales. Um, and yeah. uh, if you remember Aesop Tales, uh, um, there is a story about a rabbit versus a turtle, yeah. right? And then turtle wins the race. And uh, the, the line is that slow and steady wins the race. So the story goes that the rabbit is faster but he's been reckless and he's not sort of prepared. He's not preparing yeah. for the race, whereas uh, the turtle is preparing. And obviously when there is a day of the race, on the day of the race, the, the rabbit was parting the night before. So he falls asleep at an important part of the race and uh, the turtle slow and steadily wins the race. So it's uh, just uh, the um, kind of lucky charm for uh, that uh, symbolizes kind of steady and uh, weighted uh, approach to, to racing. And this yeah, is why that's, it's, uh, it's uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's correct. And uh, on, uh, from these two examples, we see also an important point of good luck charms. It's not what something which you select uh, yourself, but something which uh, you get from others in the example from uh, Novolari, he received it uh, from Gabriele de D'Annunzio, Prince of Monte Nervoso. He was a poet, playwright, orator, journalist, army officer, and uh, obviously a fan of uh, racing and a friend of Tassio Novolari. And uh, he gave this uh, turtle uh, with a dedication, Alomo più veloce, l'animale più lento, which sounds uh, very beautiful in Italian and uh, means, as you can see on the slide, for the fastest man, the slowest animal. Yeah, yeah, but like I said, it has obviously the Greek yes. roots uh, in uh, in these uh, tales. Yeah, in in, in the, yeah, yeah in, in in the Aesop tales. Mm -hmm. That's uh, of course right. Alberto Ascari. Yeah, we talked a lot about yeah. this driver in our series. Yeah. We have a special about him, uh, and. Um, yeah, so he he did have um, uh, superstitions, but um, I just want before Patrick explains what it was, I just want to say that uh, it yeah. had a very uh, simple reason. You know, Alberto Ascari's father died. Um, yeah. You know, at, uh, tragically in you know during a race. And um, yeah, as, as we all know, Alberto Ascari uh, died himself very young, uh, again, uh, in testing. Um, and, uh, y yeah. you know, it was uh, the kind of the consequence of the, the fact that he was superstitious was a consequence of the fact that in, in his family, you know, people died uh, in, uh, under these circumstances in racing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, interesting uh, with him, he's, uh, he was he had practically all the classic uh, superstitions like uh, black hats, letters, unlucky numbers. But besides this, also had uh, his particular uh, superstitions. Uh, for example, no one was allowed to handle the case with his pale blue helmet. And um, similar uh, to uh, what we saw before. Also here, uh, as he had his fatal accident, he... Uh, didn't uh, had his good luck charm, his uh, pale blue helmet, but uh, he wasn't uh, planned to uh, drive fast uh, on a racetrack, but he was just, I think, at the uh, Modena racetrack, and he got the opportunity to have some uh, laps with, the, uh, with a Ferrari, 
uh, with the Ferrari from Aurelio Castellotti. And as he wasn't there to race, he didn't have his helmet and he borrowed uh, from Castellotti the helmet. So as he died, he didn't have uh, his good luck charm uh, with him. Yeah, and this is how superstition spread, you know, like, of uh, course. obviously it was uh, a random event, uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, of course, uh, the, now the rumor has it that, of course, it was because he didn't have the helmet, uh, but, um, yeah, um, yeah, but a great driver and, yeah, uh, yeah. and also uh, interesting superstitions, yeah. Um, the fourth driver, the fourth Italian, uh, I don't know if you see here a pattern, but I can tell you the, <laughs> the other, other drivers. I think statistically, have you're just more likely to be Italian, right? <laughs> I'm not yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, look, uh, I mean uh, uh, you, you know statistics, of course. Uh, in the beginning uh, of racing, uh, it was your, uh, quite uh, uh, high uh, possibility if you're a race driver that you were Italian because you had all the uh, Italian manufacturers. So this explains uh, why we had uh, Italians in, in the beginning of our presentation. But anyway, we, uh, we are going uh, to Stefano uh, Modena, who wasn't uh, that successful in uh, Formula One, uh, but uh, later a uh, very good driver for, especially for touring car. Touring cars, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, his words, I'm very superstitious, so I took care to receive those signals. I always got into the car from the left-hand side, ever since karting, putting my right foot in first. This was important for me. I didn't care about being different. This was my character, and it was my results that mattered, not how much I smiled, not my superstitions. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. and uh, this is actually also quite um, quite important uh, a type of superstitions uh, that that many people have. Uh, so you know, so, uh, sometimes they, yeah, they approach their car from a certain side, or uh, you know, I had a I had a boss uh, who only entered uh, the building from the same door, from the same entrance, and he wouldn't go into any other entrance. <laughs> and once it was locked uh, by security guards because there was a um, um, fire alarm test so they locked uh, that uh, ent uh, entry into the building uh, into university and uh, uh, you know this guy just left he didn't uh, come to work that day so he just said I'm not gonna go into the lab from that uh, from from the main entrance yeah. <laughs> so, so that's uh, that's how you know that's how important uh, these things are for people Yes, and, and it shows uh, uh, again that uh, if you're speaking about superstition, it's not really related to level of uh, education. If you have a high education, if you have a low education, we see this uh, in all um, parts of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, Alexander finally, a non Italian, Alexander Wurz. Actually, uh, yeah, this is a very yeah. cool uh, superstition. So Alexander was yeah, famously uh, wore uh, mismatched uh, racing shoes. Uh, I have a friend uh, who is also from Germany. Um, and I'm sure, you know, if he hears us, he will uh, probably laugh at this point. He always wears mismatched socks. So he has always one sock is always uh, uh, like black or some, you know, dark blue or, or, or dark gray, so some conventional color. And the other sock is always very colorful. So and uh, his wife even, so it's it's just a, so such a um, uh, kind of family thing, like family s s type of tradition that his wife always gets like, two socks and uh, creates these pairs of mismatched socks for him. And uh, they even have like um, blankets and other things made of the mismatched. Uh, so the other, the other sock they didn't, that never got yeah. used. So, so those type, those types of things. So they don't actually use uh, 
the second sock to create a second pair, but they make uh, some, uh, you know, blankets or other things from uh, the the unused uh, part. <laughs> So uh, out of besides, two pairs of socks, he he effectively has one <laughs> pair of socks. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I mean, you could use the other one to mix mix with others. So no, no, that's uh, that doesn't happen. That's what I'm saying. Like you you buy, for example, uh, one pair of black socks and one pair of colorful socks, and you take one black sock and one colorful sock and put it aside, and you never use it, <laughs> but you yeah, use the other. But, uh, but this means, that, for example, also that the black one only has to be on the left because if not, I mean, you can use the black, the other black, and the other colorful and have another pair. Uh, yes, yes, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that, that's but that doesn't happen. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah. yeah. And uh, all, besides all this, um, there's of course a positive. There was a positive side effect uh, for Alexander Woods. Uh, uh, because uh, in every race, of course, the uh, journalists once they had uh, to show uh, his uh, feet, uh, his shoes, and always um, repeated uh, the same story. So he got a lot of attention uh, by the journalists, uh, which maybe he didn't uh, would have received as uh, he was a talented driver, but he wasn't, let's say, in the position to fight uh, about victories. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the professors that I know as well. Um, uh, he has a very uh, crazy habit of wearing a bright um, kind of lemon color suits. So he always comes in these uh, suits and they are really horrible, like they're <laughs> horrific. But um, he's got like everything is matched color. It's lemon, like bright lemon color. Uh, and it, you know, it's like the shirt and the socks and the shoes and uh, everything. And uh, sometimes I think it's not. Uh, so it's it's specifically done to have people mention it. Or you know, this guy in yellow suit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that you know, if if someone needs to describe him, it's actually very very easy <laughs> to do it. So I guess yeah, Alexander Wurz also probably <coughs> might. You know, he he probably wanted to be known as. Uh, a racing driver in means mismatched shoes, right? So if you, yeah. you don't remember the name, you can always give that characteristic. But the guy with the shoes. <laughs> okay. Michael Schumacher. Uh, uh, exactly. And, uh, now we're coming uh, to uh, Michael Schumacher. So uh, here we have, of course, a driver with a lot of uh, talent, but even with, if you have high talent, uh, you wanted to feel more sure about your destiny and uh, have some kind of good luck. And uh, Michael Schumacher had uh, various. Let me read it for you, especially if you're on uh, the audio podcast. Uh, Michael Schumacher had a preference for odd numbers. For example, he should receive the number four uh, at Mercedes uh, as he returned to Formula One. Uh, but asked the team to switch numbers with uh, Nico Rosberg uh, to receive the three. And he, my, uh, he said, um, Michael Schumer, uh, sorry, uh, Ross Brown knows that I like odd numbers. Um, furthermore, he always took a toy hairbrush uh, given by his daughter with him, as well as a charm from his uh, wife. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like I said, this is quite uh, quite common, uh, uh, quite common superstition when people have objects uh, that they take with them. And yeah, the numbers as well. And uh, um, I have quite a few students from China and that matters a lot. So there are yeah. some lucky numbers and unlucky numbers and apparently, you know, it really matters. Uh, so and, and I, uh, I, uh, I happen to learn <laughs> after the fact <laughs> that something was lucky number or unlucky number yeah. when they tell me. Yeah. And uh, but also here, of course, a positive uh, side effect as the uh, odd number is normally the first number. So uh, uh, having the three instead of the four uh, may show a little bit that you are the number one driver in the team, even if officially both had been on the same uh, level. So yeah. this is a positive side effect. Yeah, maybe, well, maybe it's not only side effect, but an advantage. Maybe this is the reason why he was uh, number maybe. one. <laughs> maybe. It's not only, it's not, not only the, it's not only the odd number, but also the prime number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All yeah. right. Um, but 
of course, yeah, I just uh, yeah uh, want to say that it's uh, uh, well. I really miss uh, Michael Schumacher, and uh, yeah. I hope that I his health is. Yeah, I, I hope that he recovers. I still hope that he recovers. I yeah. know that the chances are slim, but anyway, let's go to Nick Heidfeld. Yeah. And, and now we have a new uh, pattern as uh, the last one and the next one uh, coming more from a German speaking background. Uh, we're coming to quick Nick, Nick uh, Heidfeld. And uh, here the superstition to always wear two watches. I would assume uh, one of the watches with local time and one with German time, but this would be just my personal presumption. Yeah, yeah. Definitely also very popular superstition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also very practical, of course, if you are traveling through different uh, time, time zones. zones. Yeah, I have um, one of my friends is, uh, uh, is a cabin crew um, and she never changes the time on her watch never ever and it's amazing yeah. because she flies uh, this intercontinental flights and i always ask her like how does she do it because like you have all constantly have to calculate but uh, it's her superstition she never changes the, the time it's always a new york time <laughs> yeah. eastern <laughs> eastern time for her <laughs> Yeah, and maybe it helps you a little bit with the jet lag as if you uh, completely ignore local time and stay with with your time. Uh, this may help you a little bit. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, but she has very like old fashioned watch. I think that her dad gave her. So it's not the watch that shows yeah. you multiple time zones. But uh, it's it amazes me that she never missed a flight because, uh, <laughs> you know, if you go to a different yeah. country, then you need to be on time, right? <laughs> <laughs> for your for your flight so yeah i mean that's that's just amazes me anyway um, yeah, that's right from nick heidfeld to adrian uh, Sutil. Mm -hmm. uh, so here we have a, a longer quote um, let me read it the whole race weekend is a routine uh, also a something which which helps you if, if everything is somehow a routine it could be logically uh, based on logic but also on superstition of course same schedule, same program, same questions. First, I'll wear the top and then uh, the lowers. So similar as uh, if you start your day on the left or on the right foot. It's a sequence. I always step into the car from the right side. I wear the right clothes first and wear the right boot first. All the preparation has to be the same. Yeah, I'm just wondering if some people are left-handed, whether that that changes, because like we saw that uh, uh, before, right? Uh, that that you know you, you would approach the car from the left-hand side and put your right right uh, foot first. So I'm just wondering whether it's uh, different uh, for the for the left-handed uh, drivers. Yeah, uh, but um, again, this is also very important the routine. Um, uh, you know, for example, uh, in psychological studies, we often find that people do not uh, like to change their jobs, right? So sometimes people are, um, you know, refused promotion and then they don't go anywhere. They tend to stay. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, precisely because they, you know, the, their brain is used to the same routine and they're very... And they're horrified of changing it, right? So yeah, they, they have security. Yeah, they have security. So our brain works in in such a way that you know it it's, it constantly kind of tries to replicate the same routine, and when it's out of the ordinary, then it kind of gets worried, right? So a lot of people uh, do not want to worry, and they want to be, um, you know, they want to they want to have the same routine. So this is exactly. also coping mechanism, right? Coping mechanism. Exactly, and, this, and especially in, in Formula One, this helps because from a logical point, uh, you, you know that uh, it's very dangerous. But on the other hand, if you're having always the same routine, this somehow uh, um, tells you that you are inside your comfort zone and that uh, nothing can happen. That may be another reason by Formula One drivers uh, have often uh, set their rituals, which they follow uh, each time. Mm -hmm. 
So another Sebastian German, uh, Sebastian Vettel, and also uh, he has uh, a number of uh, good luck charms. Uh, first, he has a small metal pick. Then he has a one uh, cent coin, which found uh, in the, which he found in the streets of Indianapolis before he had his Formula One debut. Also, he has two pieces of silver given by his grandmother under the laces of uh, uh, his shoes. Uh, one uh, is a medal of San Christopher. Uh, which is the Catholic saint for all um, drivers, car drivers. So, uh, for example, in Germany, you see this uh, coin often in the uh, taxis. So uh, I think uh, maybe for people who are not uh, from German-speaking uh, world, we also want to explain why he, he has a pig uh, of all animals. Right. Uh, uh, so I don't know whether that's a German or Austrian. Uh, you pardon me if I'm uh, like, if it's an Austrian yeah. thing. But, uh, you know, you, you have the expression Schweinhaben, which is uh, kind of for good, good luck. Uh, and yes. pig, pig, is, uh, pig is a representative. Pig is, uh, well, Schwein yes. in German. And uh, Schweinhaben yes. is, uh, is like Glückhaben, right? So it's like Glück is, is the, the, the luck. Exactly. So, so and... and uh, 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 it's the same as saying good luck uh, <laughs> saying, uh, to, to have a pig <laughs> exactly and it's a, uh, it, uh, it's a quite common uh, good luck charm, charm like the four um, uh, lever, four cloth mm -hmm. lever so uh, at least in, in German uh, culture it's a quite common good luck charm yeah, but it's not very common for Anglo-Saxon, like people wouldn't understand why would you want to carry a pig, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, so so that's, it's just a good luck charm yeah. and in, in, in Germany and in Austria and in Switzerland, that's quite common to, uh, yeah. to have. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know about right. Netherlands, whether it's the same, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, maybe it's also similar, but yeah, I, I don't know that in uh, Austria, definitely where I lived for uh, for several years and studied uh, you know that's, yeah. that's definitely an important <laughs> important attribute of luck a uh, pig yep. <laughs> um, yeah so but uh, going back to the uh, sebastian uh, besides this all these good luck charms he also had uh, the similar uh, riddle uh, uh, riddles uh, Superstitions as same as, as, mm -hmm. superstitions as Adrian uh, Sutil, Mark Weber, Nico Hülkenberg, uh, Juan Pablo Montaya, and Kevin Magnussen, that they always uh, had the same uh, sequence of uh, doing the things. Uh, as this is quite common, uh, we not put all of them here uh, inside. Yeah, it's because it's quite common mm -hmm. that a lot of people just enter from the left or enter from the right, so they always have uh, the same uh, sequence how they do the things. Yeah, Pastor Maldonado. Pastor Maldonado uh, is a famous Venezuelan uh, driver. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was uh, the one who uh, proactively chose the 13 as his permanent uh, number for Formula One. Uh, 13, uh, in many cultures, a number of uh, bad luck. Bad luck. Mm -hmm. uh, so many times in hotels, there's no 13th floor. In uh, planes, I think there's no 13th uh, row. So if you're stepping in a plane the next time, have a look on that. Uh, but nevertheless, for some people, 13 is a number of good luck. And it seems that uh, for Pasta Maldonado, 13 was a good luck number. Yeah, that's right. And many people have actually this reverse uh, you know, sort of mm -hmm. superstition that 13 is a, is a good, good luck number. Yep. And with this, uh, we're coming uh, to the Sergio last uh, driver. Paris, for, uh, yep. Yeah, who surprised us uh, this uh, this year a lot. Well, last year a lot, <laughs> yeah. especially in so, Baku, uh, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you, uh, I mean, we're not speaking about that topic, but uh, if you follow social media, a lot of discussions since that race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so Sergio Perez, as Catholic, uh, he met uh, the Pope uh, John Paul uh, II in the early 2000s. And of course, also, uh, not only because he was Catholic, but as a, a driver, he had uh, uh, preferred 
opportunity to meet the Pope because uh, not uh, all of us, we have the opportunity to speak personally with the Pope, as you know. So, um, And since then, he was always having a photo of him while uh, driving. Uh, we started um, uh, today uh, with uh, the our episode uh, with an example from uh, Mexico, uh, speaking about the Mayan priests, and we are finishing uh, with uh, Mexico. Uh, not that surprising because it's a very Catholic uh, country, but nevertheless, uh, uh, Mexicans often still have their superstitions, which are somehow uh, related to the original uh, religions, uh, because here we have a big mixture of Catholicism and uh, former religions, most famous, of course, the Day of the Death, which is the Catholic uh, Day of the Death mixed with the uh, Aztec or other indigenous uh, celebration days. So we have this big mixtures, a lot of superstitions in the country, and Sergio Perez hasn't isn't an exception to that. Yeah, so and um, uh, I just want to, I guess, uh, since this is such a fun episode, also ask Patrick, Patrick, do you have any superstitions? <laughs> Hon honestly, uh, um, not, not really, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I have in my car uh, something which I, a good luck charm, which I received from uh, one of my trips to Brazil. Uh, and I, I keep it there. Uh, I, I mean, I, I take it from one car to the other, uh, not really because I'm too uh, uh, superstitious, but I mean, uh, I think uh, it looks nice. And so far, uh, the, I hadn't had uh, much bad luck with cars, so I keep it there. I mean, you have your uh, logical insurance, but if you have a good luck charm, uh, why not have a second uh, why not include it? I mean, it can't, it can't uh, hurt. As we saw today, uh, mostly these good luck charms hurt if you take them away, as we had these two tragic examples. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, um, and what about you? Well, um, uh, well, my family is from Eastern Europe, as uh, many, many of our viewers would know. But uh, in Eastern Europe, we have a lot of uh, superstitions. Uh, uh, black cats obviously uh, <laughs> never cross the road if the black cat crosses the road. Um, what else? Ah, yeah, so one of the funny traditions we have is um, you always, before you go somewhere, and, and this kind of goes it, it kind of deep in my family, this tradition of superstition runs in my family, where you have to sit down before you go somewhere. So before you make a trip, uh, you have to always uh, sit down before you leave the house. And uh, sometimes it gets really funny because sometimes there is no place to sit. <laughs> like literally, or there are too many people, so not everyone <laughs> has places to sit. So you, you have to sit down and you have to put your feet up. It's very important. And <laughs> so it's, it's complicated. Yeah, it's very complicated. So, yeah, it, it, it sometimes gets very, very funny, uh, but I think uh, this tradition has, I don't know why the black cats ha ha have a bad, bad reputation. There are many series, I know, but it's like, it's no, no, no single theory exists as, as far as I know. But um, the, um, the sitting down tradition, I think, uh, comes from the fact that you know, very often people rush when they pack uh, uh, to go somewhere. And when you sit down, it gives you a chance to sort of come down and think whether you have forgotten something or not. <laughs> so this yeah, is well, definitely... Yeah, there's, there's a practical, uh, logical reason besides the superstition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that it has some uh, logical roots, um, yeah. you know, and... Uh, yeah, but this is a very, very uh, common uh, tradition or superstition that uh, many Eastern Europeans exhibit. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So with that, I guess we came to the end of this uh, fun episode. Yeah. We probably didn't mention all the drivers. So if you guys know some cool superstitions from other drivers, please write us uh, some comments. Yeah. Uh, and again, the video is available on YouTube and Spotify. 
and in audio format we are available on all sorts of platforms uh, yeah. and uh, yeah we hope to see you again thanks a lot thank you bye bye bye